Hi guys, um, I'm Pete. I work in the AI Center of Excellence and I work with some of these fools over here sitting up front. And today we're going to talk about Kubeflow, which is an interesting new project. It's a fairly new project. I got involved with it about a year ago, about this time. And we're going to talk about what it is, what it means, and also how it can apply or be used in conjunction with OpenShift. So, so basically we'll go through sort of, we'll set the table and talk about a little bit about data science and then delve in a little bit to sort of the challenges that are associated with doing DevOps for machine learning. So there's been lots of machine learning sort of talks already in the, in the conference, um, but it's more than just notebooks. You've seen some of the demos and examples of, of, of notebooks. That's an important part of it, but there's more to it than that. Talk about the project, and we'll basically do a, an overview of the core components in Kubeflow. And then finally, um, we'll talk about some of the specific considerations if you're sort of just taking Kubeflow and the information we have on the community site, there's a few little gotchas that you have to understand when you're deploying it on OpenShift. And then I think a live demo, I think we're good for that. So, um, you know, <laughs> recently I've heard a lot of uh, discussions and talk about AI winters and what they're referring to is that there's been this cycle over the past few decades of, okay, now, now we're ready for AI, now we're ready for machine learning. And um, it sort of falls apart, you know, companies and institutions get invested and it's not really living up to the promises, basically. But in the year 2019, obviously things have changed dramatically. So um, in the modern age, there's a lot of well-developed techniques such as CNNs, convolutional neural networks, and other types of uh, techniques for doing machine learning. Um, and what's happened is, you know, in the age of the internet and how we're connected through various types of devices and environments, there's many more applications for machine learning than there might have been in the previous sort of go-arounds and iterations. So many of these you're very familiar with. They sort of inform our lives today. When you go on YouTube, you know, you look around at some videos, it's there suggesting some, some videos that you might also be interested in. How's it doing that? In the background, that's really where machine learning is, is doing the work. So image, voice, video recognition or other applications, character recognition. And then there's um, important applications for uh, you know, companies and, and various types of security related things like detecting fraud um, at banks or financial institutions, network intrusions for hacking. And then there's the notion of doing ranking for various types of things. So, um, last night we were looking for a restaurant and TripAdvisor gave us a recommendation of the number one restaurant in Brno. And almost certainly, you know, that wasn't just based on reviews, that's also informed by machine learning. So lots of applications. So we have the sort of new demands and these applications, but the other sort of um, sea change, if you will, with respect to machine learning is the modern hardware that we have available. So the modern CPU, and you know, I described at the point that I wrote this slide, that was sort of the, the fastest, if you will, Intel uh, core, I'm not sure if that's still true, but almost 2,000 gigaflops on a single core. So that's the CPU space. We can make use of that for um, machine learning. But we also have GPUs, and GPUs have been around for a long time in the gaming space, like we're all, you know, especially at a conference like that, there's, there's lots of us who have built uh, rigs for video gaming and stuff like that and, you know, put in GPU cards. But it turns out uh, those G GPU cards, the things that they're good at for rendering, you know, high frame rates and things like that, make them also excellent for general computa computation, like matrix multiplication and things like that. So in conjunction with the GPUs, we also have um, higher level abstractions and APIs that have been provided for the GPUs that allow um, for machine learning applications or enable machine learning applications. So kind of like the CPU at the time that I wrote this, this slide, the NVIDIA V100, the mezzanine series 
is kind of state of the art in terms of pure gigaflops and, and the processing that it does. What's different between the CPU and the GPU is that the GPU is very good at uh, parallel processing. So CPUs, of course, have general applications for various types of um, use cases, but uh, GPUs are very good for particular types of, as they say, embarrassingly parallel type computations. And let's see if this will load my YouTube video. Don't have the sound, but I threw this in there because I love this video, and this is from about, ooh, three years ago. And this was an enterprising young man in Japan who, whose parents owned a cucumber farm. <laughs> But he went away and did engineering and computer science. And he came back to them. They had this sort of problem with, um, not, not really a problem, but there is a lack of efficiency. There's actually many different types of cucumbers. And they're priced differently. And they're, you know, there's various things that go into sort of, you know, this is that type of cucumber. And it's good for, you know, I don't know, this type of salad. And it costs this much. So he, this enterprising young man, sort of put together this system using TensorFlow and deep learning to basically, um, uh, basically create a machine uh, that sorted the cucumbers for them. So, whoops, let's get rid of that. And let's go back to my presentation. Sorry about that. Yeah. So um, the point, the, the reason I threw that in there is it's a fascinating sort of um, example of how machine learning has become almost commoditized. Um, the CPUs for doing machine learning, even some of the lower end GPUs that can do you know, a, a fair amount of uh, high end processing um, are fairly affordable. So um, that's really enabled um, you know, sort of this sort of um, this explosion of interest in machine learning. So uh, I don't know if Marcel's here, but I stole this. We did a workshop on Friday uh, with Kubeflow. And it's a pretty good sort of demonstration of a simplified machine learning uh, workflow and pipeline. So there are these different types of tasks that are involved for a data scientist and the people who help the data scientists sort of um, basically render or deploy their work and give it out to the world. So there's the notion of uh, dealing with data sets that are put into the uh, machine learning algorithms. So keeping track of those is difficult. Um, the data sometimes has to be cleaned and prepared. Um, and then you go into this sort of iterative cycle of model development and uh, training the model. And um, if you have to manage that, you know, sort of in a manual fashion, it can be sort of cumbersome and inefficient. So, um, and then there's the case when you want to, you've derived a model and you want to serve it and actually have um, data hit it so that um, there can be sort of probabilistic sort of um, computations made against that model. There's the notion of reproducibility. So it worked for me in my environment. Here, you use it. How do we make sure it's going to work in that other environment? And also the scalability. So these are some of the challenges in a pipeline for machine learning. So if we sort of think of that pipeline and sort of decompose it into some of these individual steps that I talked about, um, what's important to understand is that there's different sort of environments and systems that are well suited for doing these things. So something like working with a notebook, maybe that requires a particular type of environment. But if you're actually uh, training the model or serving the model, maybe what you need is a different type of environment that's GPU enabled. GPUs are typically you know, more expensive in terms of the time that you need for um, making use of the, the computation. You know, the physical hardware for GPUs is more expensive than the typical uh, CPU. So um, you sort of begin to see that we need some way to sort of organize these components, but also allow a certain degree of flexibility. It's, it's not good enough or sufficient to have sort of a monolithic sort of pipeline that only works in one type of environment. So um, there's all these different pieces that we need for an ML platform. And it's been difficult over the years for any one project or institution to basically 
you know, try and decompose this problem and, and break it down. So um, this is where Kubeflow sort of got started. It was the idea of a bunch of, uh, a couple of Google engineers who are still involved with the project. And the idea was to start with sort of um, this high-level mission statement. So um, whatever we build for this uh, platform, it should be portable. So if I'm doing development on my laptop or a bare metal, that, that's fine, but it should also be able to uh, work just the same way in a cloud environment like GCP or EC2, what have you. Um, it should be scalable. Again, I'm doing development on one machine, my laptop. I should be able to basically scale that out so that I get the processing power of, say, hundreds of, hundreds of hosts, hundreds of nodes. And it should be composable. So, you know, microservice architecture has been with us for, you know, many years now. And it's, uh, it's not going away. It's, it's a good model in terms of having well-defined separation of concerns between these different components that we saw in the machine learning pipeline, okay? So it turns out that OpenShift and Kubernetes, upon which OpenShift is built, are actually you know, a really good platform for taking on this kind of challenge. So that was part of the idea for these Google engineers. They'd done some of this with um, some of the uh, infrastructure at Google, including at the time Kubernetes was, was being developed. And um, what, they bid, that what they did is basically take the ideas that they developed, sort of the patterns for these pipelines that were actually used in the YouTube recommendation platform and sort of brought them forward as an open source community project. And that is what Kubeflow is today. So, so the, the mission for Kubeflow is basically um, make these deployments of machine learning workflows Specifically on Kubernetes, simple, portable, and scalable. Kubernetes is an important point that it's not trying to be uh, something that's deployed in different types of, uh, say, cloud environments, like just purely VM or something like that. It is organized around Kubernetes specifically for the reasons that I previously mentioned. Also, another part, important point with uh, Kubeflow is that it's not trying to reinvent some of the other uh, machine learning ecosystem projects. We have TensorFlow, we have PyTorch, okay? So what it is, it's aggregating these projects basically and stitching them together to render sort of that idealized um, platform where we have a comprehensive uh, workflow or pipeline uh, for these things. It's not trying to build yet another um, Python API for machine learning. So it's incorporating all the, the, all the most popular ones. And then finally, anywhere you're able to run Kubernetes, you should be able to run Kubeflow, at a minimum with the CPU processing power that's available to um, the nodes. Also, with uh, Kubernetes, it has enablement for NVIDIA GPUs, and so pods can be scheduled, particularly on specific uh, GPU nodes. So. Mentioned generally true for OpenShift, it is. It, it works on OpenShift. Um, OpenShift, we're gonna get to it later, you know, has its enterprise class and it has enhanced security features and some of those need to be addressed when you install Kubeflow. The community today, um, basically it's hosted on GitHub. It's an ASL2 license. There's over 20 repositories, 23 to be exact. And in the core um, repo, which is called Kubeflow itself, there's about 143 contributors and over 1,000 commits. So that's all happened in the span of about a year and change, about you know, 13 months. So we're currently, we just released 0 0.4. We're doing planning for 0 0.5. And ideally in 2019, there will be a major 1.0 release. Um, as a community, we are trying to work through in various sort of um, fashions, including like a product management group that we've created, what it means to be a 1.0 release for this. And a lot of that has to do with documentation, uh, testing, and um, yeah. So um, there's been a lot of integrations. Some integrations happened early on in the project, and there's new integrations that are continuously happening. 
So you see there, um, Google gets a little bit larger in that circle there. Um, we have participation from Red Hat, but Google, um, the project was started at Google. It's still the lion's share of uh, community involvement is from Google engineers, but we have uh, definitely had significant contributions from Microsoft, NVIDIA, Alibaba, Kai Cloud in, in China, uh, Cisco, Canonical, uh, GitHub, not just for the hosting, they've been actually uh, making use of Kubeflow as well, uh, into Intel and the Jupyter project. So. so at a high level, just on this one page, we're gonna delve into some of the, what I think are sort of the important sort of components here. Um, but we have this notion of core components. We started out in the project with sort of what was defined as a core, and the core was really organized around Jupyter Hub. That's still true today. Um, I put an asterisk there beside Jupyter Hub. We are in the process of possibly, well, it looks like we will. We're gonna probably remove the Jupyter Hub spawner in, in um, lieu of an opinionated version of a spawner that is um, much more Kubernetes native, cloud native, than what is provided by um, Jupyter Hub. Uh, there's Ambassador, um, which is another project in the Kubernetes e ecosystem. I'm going to talk about that. And then there's some internal sub-projects in there. Um, so Catib for hyperparameter tuning. And just recently, um, Google has invested a lot of effort and uh, um, manpower, if you can use that term, uh, into Kubeflow pipelines. So there's a training controller for launching TF jobs. That's one of the things we demonstrated in the um, workshop on Friday. And also there's uh, TensorFlow serving, but there's also optional components and we'll see with Kubeflow, it has uh, basically a fairly flexible deployment architecture that's enabled by KSNet, and I'll talk about that. There's Arco, Argo in the, another uh, Kubernetes ecosystem project that's used for workflow management. There's a PyTorch operator. There's Selden, I'll talk about that in de detail, and Pachyderm. Basically, the takeaway here is there's lots of different sub-projects, and the idea, there, there's a bit of overlap with some of these sub-projects, but the idea is each one contributes to sort of this comprehensive machine learning platform that I was talking about earlier. So, um, most of you, I think, have made some use of OpenShift, and you understand sort of the notion of these resource objects and how they're sort of represented through um, JSON and YAML. Um, there is a Kubernetes ecosystem project called KSNet, which is used heavily in the Kubeflow project, basically. So it allows us the flexibility. It, it's based on uh, the JSONet language, but it allows us the flexibility of having very uh, powerful expressions around what is uh, deployed, how it's parameterized, how it interacts with um, the other components in the platform. And um, the key thing there is, it, the reason it's called KSNet is um, there are native um, definitions in KSNet that relate to things that we recognize from Open, OpenShift and Kubernetes, so pods, services, um, uh, cluster roles, role bindings, things like that, okay? So that's how, what we use to define sort of the integration of the Kubeflow project, and that's what we use to generate ultimately the YAML that um, produces uh, a running Kubeflow um, environment. So the important thing to understand is there's nothing sort of magic or, I mean, <laughs> What it renders, basically, is YAML that you would otherwise just recognize from any other type of interaction you've had with uh, Kubernetes. So you would see pod definitions, you would see service definitions. It's all the same. The way it's originally expressed is in JSON and sort of this particular uh, DSL, but what you get is something that you can still manipulate yourself. So. Um, and another reason we use KSNet is that it makes it very easy. Again, we talked about we wanted it to be sort of portable. And KSNet gives us this general ability to have Kubeflow be fairly portable. We can specify that 
This is the deployment we want for a dev environment, and we're going to tweak it slightly, maybe different, uh, say, S3 endpoints or something like that for our test or staging environment. And then change it again for production, okay? So it allows us to, you know, heavily parameterize the, the different components for these different environments, okay? And the other thing is, it's, so it's, um, it's basically resource aware. So if you make a change in your case on that for Kubeflow in terms of I update parameter X or whatever it is, uh, all you have to do is reapply uh, that change and it'll go through and update the deployed com components. Also, finally, you can tear down that environment with case and that. You can basically have it delete all those resources and just start again. Um, notebooks are very important for the project. Um, like I said, we currently use Jupyter Hub and KubeSpawner for launching our notebooks. Um, but uh, that is about to change in the next couple of months. We're going to go to a simplified um, web app that will have better integration with the underlying Kubernetes um, RBAC security model and kind of do away with some of the stuff. Jupyter and Jupyter Hub, the spawners that are in that collection there were designed for a variety of different types of environments. And the community has come to the conclusion that we're probably better off just having something that's highly opinionated for spawning the notebooks, okay? The other thing uh, the Kubeflow project does is it curates TensorFlow CPU and GPU notebooks going back to TensorFlow 1.4.1, okay? And we stay current. We have, uh, I believe, 1.12.0. We're, we're up to date with that. I don't know if we have the, 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 late, the very latest version. These are based on the default builds from the TensorFlow, TensorFlow project. Um, some of my colleagues in the AI Center of Excellence are doing enhanced builds of TensorFlow for the different types of uh, RHEL uh, platforms, so Fedora, CentOS. Um, these ones that are currently in the Kubeflow community are just derived without any specific changes from uh, the images that or sorry, the, the wheel files that are created by the TensorFlow uh, project. Now, we've set up these notebooks such that um, they're, they're oriented around TensorFlow. There's some visualization and some libraries in there that are useful for the data scientists, but they have the permissions to go ahead and install any supporting packages that they might uh, deem interesting or necessary for their work. Um, we have a, a notebook for, adapted for the Kaggle project. Of course, Kaggle is where you have these competitions for machine learning. Some of them actually pay significant prizes. And um, they have a, um, a notebook that we've adapted for Kubeflow. It's a very large notebook. It's over 20 gig. But that's because Kaggle kind of wants the kitchen sink in there. <laughs> that not only do they have TensorFlow, they have PyTorch and all the other uh, libraries in there as well. So, um, and recently, just before the end of last year, uh, we did an adaptation of a new project from NVIDIA, which is Rapids AI. And Rapids um, is basically uh, a set of Python libraries that are specifically designed for GPU acceleration. And they include data frame manipulation, uh, various types of machine learning algorithms, and also a library for graph processing. Um, in terms of deploying Kubeflow, we uh, make use of Ambassador, and that's an ingress controller. That's based on the Envoy project, which has been very successful. Uh, Istio is also based on Envoy, and um, it gives us a cloud-native capability for ingress into the, what we call the Kubeflow cluster. There's the Kubernetes and OpenShift cluster that the components are deployed on, and then there's the various uh, Kubeflow components in there. So that's our ingress controller. In OpenShift, it probably, you know, it serves something of the same role as the HA proxy. Um, so that's an area that we'll probably explore more this year about making that uh, deployment option more configurable. That includes a reverse proxy. Um, 
And it uses annotations, and I mean Kubernetes annotations on the components to do the URL mapping to services. So we have links to our Jupyter Hub, uh, the TF Jobs UI pipeline. And currently it integrates with uh, Google IAP for authentication. It can also integrate with Cert Manager. And uh, I think there's more work being done with Ambassador for integration with other types of um, auth uh, controllers. Um, we also make use of Argo. Uh, Argo is, again, you'll see this pattern in Kubeflow. We're making use of different projects that have Kubernetes native um, capabilities. And Argo is one of those. It's provided by Intuit. It's an open source project. And uh, it's a CRD and an operator. And we actually use it in a variety of ways within the project. So at the application level, it's used within the Kubeflow pipeline so, uh, project. Um, there's also Kubebench, which is basically a Kubernetes machine learning um, platform, you know, benchmark test, basically. But for the community itself, it actually drives our pre- and post-submit workflows. So when uh, we're ready to um, approve a pull request and merge that into our master, it, uh, well, even as the pull request is put up there, it goes, it's put through a pre-submit test and then submitted uh, to a test again. All that is controlled by Argo. So, and the way it works is you're basically specifying in YAML um, different types of directed acyclic graphs, you know, and that's your workflow. So it's good for basically organizing some of these jobs and where in these pipelines where you have inputs and outputs and you know this this step in the workflow needs for this other batch step to complete so it's cloud agnostic but it's it's definitely designed for um, kubernetes at its at its heart um, i mentioned argo the follow on from that is the kubeflow pipelines project early on in the project um, there was a company and a project called pachyderm that got involved with Kubeflow and we provided um, sort of an integration for uh, Pachyderm. It does data pipelines and, and governance basically using sort of a Git check-in model. I suspect what's gonna happen is that the Kubeflow pipeline subproject is kinda gonna overtake some of the capabilities um, that were previously defined in Pachyderm. We'll see how it plays out. Um, Kubeflow as a project is fairly open and you know encompassing like we're ready to adapt various different types of ideas and components but a year on we're starting to see areas where there's a little bit of overlap and um, this will probably be sort of the challenge for 1.0 um, is drawing a circle in kubeflow and saying what are the core components what are truly the components that um, are necessary so so the Pipelines project, it has a UI for managing and tracking the experiments and the jobs, and it's operator-based, so again, it's doing scheduling of these uh, machine learning workflows, and it has a Python SDK for basically doing an annotation-based sort of um, specification for uh, the pipelines and components. So it's, it's fairly powerful. Again, it uses Argo under the hood as a workflow orchestrator. Um, Selden is its, a, its own project, but it was also one of the early sort of adaptations or integrations that we had in Kubeflow. And um, Selden is entirely about doing deployment and management of the uh, inference graphs and being able to scale those out on a Kubernetes platform. So it's a perfect fit for um, Kubeflow. And, um, the way it's set up is that it has basically specifications for different components and you can organize those different uh, pipeline components in various ways. So there's a transformer, a router, a combiner, output transformer. And the way these would be used is, oh my gosh, 10 minutes? Okay. <laughs> um, A-B testing, multi-arm bandit, these are sort of concepts that are known in the space for um, doing uh, testing of, you know, you have a variety of models, you want to basically probe and inspect which of these models are um, 
uh, performing the best, basically. So it supports uh, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, as um, interfaces for gRPC and REST. And interestingly, they use S2I, OpenShift S2I. Now, as before, even Red Hat got involved in Kubeflow or had anything to do with Selden. They had sort of discovered it at, on their own and found that it was a, uh, an excellent utility for doing these model wrappers that are then deployed as pods. Ah, Kubeflow and OpenShift. So we've talked about Kubeflow, how it sort of exists naturally on uh, Kubernetes. So on the website, um, going back some ways, there's a troubleshooting section for different things like Minikube and stuff like that. I added one a long time ago for OpenShift. It's slightly out of date now. <laughs> uh, it needs to be updated. And um, so the challenges with OpenShift, of course, you know, it's our, our beloved product and we regard it as the enterprise Kubernetes. It's, you know, focused around developers with the S2I. Uh, capabilities, and as we all know, it has these extended sort of concepts about, you know, in Kubernetes you have a namespace, we've enhanced that as a project, and then there's the notion of users and things like that. But in conjunction with that, with the development of OpenShift, we put in all these best practices that we've learned over time as Red Hatters about how to securely um, deploy components in the cloud. However, um, the lion's share of contributions to the Kubeflow community comes from Google, it comes from um, other, other companies and individuals, and they do their development with just Kubernetes. Now, they do it with um, RVAC turned on, but at times in developing some of the, say, the Docker files and the images, they don't think about things like UIDs and, and these types of considerations. Also, um, what's happened is the advent of the operator model, and you know, Red Hat has been a big proponent of that, uh, certainly with Core OS. So, um, and typically with the operator model, you have a CRD, and then you have cluster roles and cluster role bindings, and um, there's more and more of these, not only showing up in the integrations into Kubeflow, but being developed within Kubeflow itself. So sometimes, um, and certainly uh, we do, and we use an internal OpenShift platform that's hosted for us called OpenShift, where we don't always have the permissions we'd like for deploying some of these neat new features, like some of the operators we're interested in. So that creates certain challenges, friction points for us. So um, the, the reason I've been sort of reluctant to sort of blindly update the troublesho troubleshooting section for the community pages is, um, to quickly enable a deployment of Kubeflow on OpenShift, we can make use of certain cluster admin features where we say, okay, for this service account, we'll give them any UID. That's not ultimately the right solution. What we want to do is sort of work our way back to the image and have it properly developed, like on the RAD Analytics Spark project, where they take appropriate steps to have a user defined for um, the component that's running. So that would, that's the proper way to mitigate some of these things. Having said that, you know, if you're interested in running this um, and getting up to speed quickly on it, there are shortcuts. And you'll see if you naively installed 0 0.4 on OpenShift 3.11, you would start going through and seeing these failed pods. And if you look at the logs, they'll say, hey, I can't bind to port 80. And that's OpenShift stepping in saying, no, can't do that, <laughs> it's a reserved port. Um, and it's because of the UID that has or hasn't been, in fact, specified for that image. I think Ambassador has done some work to adjust that, but I need to properly test that. Um, so you go through that, thank you. And um, then when you get to one of the components that is min.io, again, we fall on this thing where there's a problem with the UID. In this case, it doesn't yet, as of today, have a service account. So there's no trick we can do by saying add SS, SCC to user for that. So we sort of give in and cry uncle and say, okay, system authenticate. <laughs> Again, that's not something I really want in the troubleshooting section necessarily. So it's sort of a debate I'm having about what is correct information to have up there. 
Finally, um, I mentioned CATIB. CATIB is a subproject for hyperparameter tuning in Kuplo. And um, uh, it wants to write, well, there's actually the use of MySQL pods in two different sort of subcomponents. And they both run into the same problem where it's trying to write its uh, varlib MySQL storage to a, a place that needs to be, at least in a, a rel environment, you need to basically set the appropriate SE Linux permissions on that location. So various things there, but that's generally it. It, you know, it basically works. It definitely helps to have cluster admin, and in the workshop that Marcel and I did, we kind of, for the benefit of all these users we'd set up for the workshop, we had to make them cluster admin, and that's just kind of the way things stand today. So there's work to be done in 2019 for doing the adaptation. Uh, I don't think I have time for a live demo. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so let's, let's do a little demo. Um, so in the workshop, we demonstrated TF jobs. Um, here, I'll just show you sort of the dashboard. And this is our central dashboard. This is what you get when you, um, uh, when Kubeflow is deployed. You have links to the website. You have a link to Jupyter Hub, and also the TF Jobs UI, Catib dashboard, and then a pipeline dashboard. For the live demo, we'll keep it simple. We'll just go to Jupyter Hub, and let's see what we have. I have a notebook running. That's too easy. We'll stop that because I want to show you launching a brand new uh, pod. Okay. So this is what our uh, version of the um, Jupyter Hub spawner looks like. Um, this used to be done as an HTML5 data frame, and we had a pre-populated list. These are the curated um, images that we have in the Google Container Registry. Okay, you can actually switch to custom and just you know type in any image location that you want. It is important to understand that there are certain scripts that need to be in place for the image to be launched from Kubeflow. We do a check to see that the Jovian uh, PVC is in place and things like that. But let's spawn a new notebook. And that image should be in place. Hopefully it won't take too long. While that's happening, any questions I can answer while we're hourglassing? No? Clear as mud? Okay. And there we go. And let's pull up a new Python 2. We'll kick it old school, Python 2 notebook. And then there's MNIST Hello World. We'll grab all that. And this is a very basic check to confirm that um, TensorFlow you know, is installed in the pod and we can make use of it. So we'll just copy that in there. And the MNIST uh, data set is basically a collection of digits and labels. So it's sort of a basic confirmation of whatever you know, machine learning sort of framework you're working with and also the algorithms uh, for doing uh, a machine learning computation that predicts, you know, makes a guess about what the image is based on the information that it's processing from the model. And we'll run that. And we'll see what we get. Fingers crossed. Live demo. It's doing its thing. Some warnings from TensorFlow. Now, we curate, as I mentioned, CPU and GPU. This is running on a CPU only. Um, uh, node, and that last number at the bottom, can you see it there, the 0 0.9, that is the accuracy of its guess about the number set. So, and that's, this is sort of the, the storefront window dressing for Kubeflow. There are a lot of other components. I simply don't have the time, and you guys might not have the interest in <laughs> looking at all the other stuff, but that's basically it. No questions? Good. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. 
<laughs> okay, well, thank you for your time.